All right, students, let's do some test prep on 5.3 second derivative test. So this first one, what I'm going to try and point out on most of the problems that I work through when I'm looking at all this stuff, there's a lot of information to take into some of these problems. So I focus in on the most important part, and that is this right there. We're looking for the point of inflection. So if I focus in on finding that, and I don't even worry about g of x. It's just, to me, it's just a bunch of blah, blah, blah for now because I need to focus what I'm looking for. A point of inflection is going to happen when the second derivative changes signs. Now typically that's when it equals zero, but really I'm looking for when does the second derivative change signs. So let's then now, now that I put that down, now I know what to do with this problem. So I find the first derivative first, and that's gonna be, well, let's rewrite this so I can help myself here, x squared minus 8x to the negative 1. So that's just the regular function rewritten. So the derivative then is 2x plus 8x to the negative 2, because I subtract 1. And then the second derivative then would be 2 minus 16x to the negative 3. So now I take the second derivative, set it equal to 0. So this is going to be minus 16 over x cubed equals uh, zero, solve it, uh, and really I could probably stop here, but I'll keep going a little bit. Let's go two equals 16 over x cubed. Uh, let's see, I'll multiply by x cubed. I could just kind of cross multiply here. Multiply both sides by x cubed at the same time. Whoops, that's a cubed. And then at the same time, divide both sides by two. So I get that. So x equals the cube root of both sides is 2. x equals 2. Now technically I would need to check and make sure that the uh, that in order for this to be a point of inflection that the second derivative is going to change signs uh, right there. So where's the second derivative? This. That the second derivative changes signs. So I would need to plug in a point before 2 and after 2. But if you look at your options x equals 2 is the only option. Now, I don't have an option here of none of the above. So since that's the case, I know that's going to be the point of inflection. Number two, we're looking at the domain of the function f. Okay, so they're telling us we only care about x values greater than zero. And they give us the first derivative. To me, this is all just a bunch of blah, blah, blah. I need to get down to what they're really asking for. Concave down. We're asking for when is it concave down. A function f is concave down if the second derivative is less than zero. That's what I'm looking for. When is the second derivative less than zero? So that's my first approach. Now that I know what I'm looking for, I need to find the second derivative. So here's the first derivative. So the second derivative, I'm going to have to use the product rule because I have two things going on here, an x times a natural log of x. So the second derivative is going to equal, so the derivative of the first is just 1 times the second one left alone. And I will add the first one left alone and take the derivative of the second one, 1 over x. Derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. Okay, so now what can I do? Simplify this. So the second derivative equals natural log of x plus 1, x times 1 over x. Okay, so I'll set this second derivative equal to 0 and solve it. So natural log of x equals negative 1. How do I solve these? I am going to go e raised to that e raised to the negative 1. So then I get x equals e to the negative 1 is 1 over e. This is when it is equal to 0. I want to know when the second derivative is less than 0. So this helps me set up a chart of values. So I'm going to go from 1 over e and I know that, oh that was awful, it's okay if it's squiggly, I know that the second derivative at this point, 1 over e is going to be a 0. All right, so now I need to know what's going on before that. So I only I have to stay between 0 uh, because it says x is greater than 0. So I'm going to plug a number in that's less than 1 over e squared, and I'm going to plug it into the second derivative. Okay, So I'm focusing in on what is the value of the second derivative right there. Um, Okay, so a number smaller than that, this is going to be hard. So how about I do a number bigger than 1 over e to start us off? How about, what's a bigger than 1 over e? How about the number 1? Okay, so if I do the, plug in the natural log of 1, I'm going to get the natural log of 1 plus 1. Well, that's 0. 
plus 1. Okay, it's positive. Okay, so it's definitely not over here when x is greater than 1 over e, so I know it's not that. I also know that e has nothing to do with this problem, so I'm not going to worry about that, and it's not 0 to e, the e has nothing to do with it. We know it's going to have something to do with this 1 over e. In fact, that might help you by process of elimination to know that it's going to be this answer, because 0 to 1, 1 has nothing to do with our intervals. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. 1 is not an interval that I'm looking at. Okay, that makes it so that this one is the only possible answer. I hate it when the problems have like a choice of none of the above, because then you really have to do all the work. But since we've eliminated all the other ones, I know that's the answer. But if you wanted to test it out for yourself just to prove that it's negative down in here, you'd have to plug in a number smaller than 1 over e. So you'd have to be pretty good and figure out like, okay, maybe something like 1 over e squared squared, that's smaller than 1 over e, so then you could plug that in, the natural log of e to the negative 2 plus 1, and so then that's negative 2 plus 1, and that's negative 1, so it is negative, there we go, so that's the proof of it. But hopefully you can see just process of elimination can help you out on that one. Number 3, so we have a lot of things going on here, we've got a function whose derivative is this, blah 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 stuff, that's just the derivative, notice the little prime right there. And then it is clear that the first derivative evaluated at an x value of e is going to equal 0. What that means is that e is a critical number. So if the first derivative equals 0, there we have a critical number, which means a possibility of having a max or min. This is a candidate for a max or min. So now they're saying the value of the second derivative of e is negative, positive, negative, positive. So is it negative or positive? And then does that make it a local min or a local max? That's what we're going to try and figure out. So to do this, we've got to first find what in the world is the second derivative. So the double prime of f equals, this is quotient rule stuff. All right, so let's make my big long fraction. On bottom, I'm going to have x squared squared. So it'll be x to the fourth for my quotient rule. So now I take the derivative of the top. The derivative of that is negative 1 over x. Okay, the der derivative of 1 is 0, and then I have negative natural log of x, so the derivative of that is negative 1 over x, and then times it by the derivative, I mean, excuse me, times it by the bottom. Subtract, now I will leave the numerator alone, 1 minus natural log of x, and multiply that by the derivative of the bottom, which is going to be 2x. Okay, now I could simplify this, but I'm really trying to figure out, is plugging in an e, is it going to make this positive or negative? So I know for sure when I plug in an e down here, that is going to be positive. There's no doubt about that. Okay, so I don't have to worry about that. So now really it's just the numerator. Is the numerator positive or negative? So let's clean this up just a little bit so just to make this easier. So I have uh, negative, what is this, x squared over x simplifies to just negative x. And then this is going to be minus 2x times 1 minus natural log of x. Let's plug in the e. So I get uh, minus e minus 2 times e, and then this is 1 minus the natural log of e. What's the natural log of e? Natural log of e is 1. So this is 1 minus 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So that all cancels. This is just minus that whole thing right there is just a 0. So what am I left with? Negative e. It's negative. OK. So if the second derivative is negative, because the bottom was positive, if the second derivative is negative, that means it's either got to be a or c. So which one is it? Local min, local max. If you have, think about this, e is a, e is a critical value. So we have a horizontal tangent. So it's either a minimum or a maximum. If it is negative, that means it is concave down. So it is opening like that, which forces it to be a maximum. There we go. Number four, consider the function blah, blah, blah. I don't care about that function yet. What I care about is this. We want to look for the function is decreasing on what intervals? It's decreasing when f prime is less than zero. That's when it's decreasing. So that's what I'm looking for. Finding an interval when this thing is less than zero. So find the derivative. F prime is going to equal 
27 minus 3x squared. Now I'm going to set it equal to 0 to figure out when it actually equals 0. Negative 3x squared equals negative 27. x squared equals 9. x equals plus or minus 3. Okay, so there are my critical values. Negative 3, positive 3. So now, and that is perfect because look at all of my possible answers. I got a bunch of things with 3s and negative 3s. Okay, so let's set up a quick little chart here. Negative 3 and 3. So this is the way I like to do this. I know Mr. Brustis is a little bit different, but it's the same idea. Let's see how straight I can make that. Oh, not bad. So I'm going to look for when is the derivative negative. That's what I'm looking for. Remember that? This is my whole goal right here. So I know that the derivative is 0 right there. And I know that the first derivative is 0 right here. So what about in between them? Um, let's choose an x value. Yeah, these are my x's up here. So let's choose an x value in between here. Well, that's easy enough. Let's choose 0. So what's the derivative in between negative 3 and 3? It's going to be, where's my derivative? Uh, right here. So there's my derivative. So plug in a 0, you get 27. So this is positive. Okay, so it's definitely not in this interval. So can I cancel any of these? Yes. It's not from negative 3 to 3. 0 to 3 makes no sense. Okay, I don't have any of those intervals. It's going to be from before negative 3 or after 3. So nothing to do with 0. Nothing to do with 0. And negative 3 square root of 3, there's no square root of 3 either. Okay, it has nothing to do with that. So because you can, so you can, by process of elimination, we've already identified the answer's got to be E because we've already proven that it can't be any of these others. So then all we'd have to do really is plug in a number that's less than negative 3, like negative 100, and then a number that's bigger than 3, like positive 100 or 1,000, 10,000, something like that. And then you just plug in the number. So 27 minus... Something that you're squaring, even though it's a negative number, you're squaring it and making this positive. So you're going to have 27 minus something big. This will be negative. This one will be negative. And that's why that fits perfectly for our answer. Last one. So as you read through this, what's important? We've got some function, all real numbers. F prime equals this mess of a thing, blah, blah. F is decreasing decreasing on what interval? Well, shoot, isn't that the same thing we just did on this one? Yeah, function is decreasing on specific intervals. It's the same idea. So we're just trying to figure out when is it decreasing. It decreases when the first derivative equals uh, f prime is negative, less than 0. OK, so we take the derivative. When does that thing equal 0? It only equals 0 when the numerator equals 0. So let's take 9 minus x squared, absolute value equals 0. Get rid of the absolute value by making the other side plus or minus. Okay, so that's how you get rid of an absolute value. It would then equals plus or minus 0, but there's no such thing as a positive or negative 0. So it's just 0. Solve this, you get x squared equals 9, x equals plus or minus 3 again. Okay, that's popular. Plus or minus 3. Now, if you stop for a second, and some of you might recognize that 3 cannot be plugged into this denominator there, because 3 minus 3 would be 0, and that's a big no-no. So that doesn't give us too much of a problem, because this is the derivative. If this was the original function, then we'd have a problem. We couldn't use that number 3. But the derivative, uh, we're trying to still just kind of figure out, okay, yeah, so the 3 is like a, a critical point still, because it makes the derivative not exist. So we're still going to use it to test our intervals, because it is a critical value. So I'm going to go from negative 3 to 3. I'm going to make a quick little chart here. Uh, so at 3, I know my first derivative is 0 there. And this one, it's undefined. So I'll say does not exist, DNE. That's hard to read. Does not exist. But that's OK. Let's just keep going and look in these intervals for when is the derivative less than 0. Now, can you tell by the things that I have set up why I cannot say from negative infinity to infinity? This one would make no sense because I know the derivative does not exist at 3. So I can't say that it's on that entire interval. Also, this number 6 has nothing to do with with my intervals here. So I'm going to cross that one off and not stress about that. Okay, these other ones though, these could be where my possibilities lie. Oh no, not the negative and 3 infinity. Not that one. Because look here, negative 3 to infinity. That wouldn't make any sense because we'd be crossing 3 again and I know 3 does not exist. Oh, so this is how you can already narrow it down between A and E. 
But now let's actually figure out how to do this exactly. And that is plug in numbers to the derivative and see. So let's plug in a number that's really simple, zero. So here's the nice thing. I will always have a positive on top. You don't have to plug in anything to the numerator because you're taking the absolute value. It's always positive. So all we need to check is the denominator. Is it negative or positive? Zero minus three is negative. So this is negative. Plug in a big number. How about a thousand after this? So if I plug in a really big number, uh, bigger than three, a thousand minus three, that's positive. And over here, let's plug in a negative billion numbers, super big. So negative billion minus three is also negative. All right, so what am I looking for? When is it negative? It is negative this side of three. From three over, it's negative, negative. So that is what, negative infinity to three. All right, that's all of it. Hope this helped you a bit and good luck on the master check.